In this video, we will discuss some popular sorting algorithms. Let's start with bubble sort. Bubble sort works by repeatedly stepping through the list, comparing adjacent elements, and swapping them if they are in the wrong order. If the element on the right is smaller than the one on the left, we swap them. This process is repeated for each pair of adjacent elements, effectively bubbling the largest unsorted element to its correct position at the end of the list. The process continues until no more swaps are needed, indicating that the list is fully sorted. Now imagine if the list is already sorted. In this case, the algorithm will simply traverse the list once, comparing adjacent elements. Since all elements are already in the correct order, no swapping will occur. Bubble sort is optimized to stop early in such scenarios, as it can detect when the list is sorted and terminate, making it more efficient in this particular case. Now let's go through the Python code for bubble sort. First, we define a function that takes the array as an input parameter. We store the length of the array in the variable n. The algorithm uses a loop that runs n times. Inside this loop, we use a variable called swapped to keep track of whether any swapping has occurred during the current pass. We then use a nested loop that runs from the beginning of the array to the last unsorted position. Pause this video and put some pressure on your brain to understand why the loop runs to n minus i minus 1. Within this loop, we compare each pair of adjacent elements. If the previous element is greater than the next element, we swap them and set the swapped variable to true to indicate that a swap has occurred. After the nested loop completes, we check the swapped variable. If no swaps were made, we break out of the outer loop early as this indicates that the array is already sorted and no further passes are needed. The time complexity will be big O of n square in the average case, because it involves two nested loops, the outer loop for each pass and the inner loop for comparing and swapping adjacent elements. However, in the best case, when the array is already sorted, the algorithm only needs to traverse the list once without making any swaps. So the complexity in this scenario will be linear, the space complexity is constant because bubble sort sorts the array in place and does not require any additional space beyond a few variables. The next algorithm is insertion sort. We start by assuming that the first element is already sorted. Then we take each subsequent element from the unsorted portion of the list and insert it into its correct position within the sorted portion. For each element, we compare it with the elements in the sorted portion and shift the larger elements to the right to make space. If the array is already sorted, the algorithm will simply traverse the list without making any insertions or shifts. Now let's see the code for this. First, we define the function with the array as the input parameter. We run a loop from the second element to the end, assuming the first element is already sorted. Inside the loop, we initialize a variable key to hold the current element, and a variable j to represent the last index of the sorted portion of the array. We then use a while loop, with the condition that j is greater than or equal to zero, and the key is less than the element at index j. Within this loop, we assign the element at j to the next position, j plus 1, and then decrement j. 
This process effectively shifts the elements to the right. After the while loop, we assign the key to the J plus 1 element, placing it in its correct position. This ensures the current element is inserted into the sorted portion of the array. The time complexity of insertion, sort in the best case, when the array is already sorted, is linear, because no shifting is required, and the inner loop does not run. However, in the average and worst cases, the time complexity is big O of n square, due to the shifting of elements. In these cases, both nested loops run, resulting in more comparisons and shifts. The space complexity is constant, because the algorithm sorts the array in place, and does not require extra space beyond a few variables. Next is the selection sort. This algorithm is quite simple. It starts by finding the smallest element in the entire list, and swapping it with the element in the first position. Then, it finds the smallest element in the remaining unsorted portion, and swaps it with the element in the second position. This process continues, gradually expanding the sorted portion of the list while shrinking the unsorted portion. Now let's look at the code for selection sort. It starts by defining a function that takes the unsorted array as input. We then create a variable n to hold the length of the array. A for loop runs n times to process each element. Within the loop, we initialize a variable min index to keep track of the index of the minimum value found in the unsorted portion of the array. An inner loop runs from the beginning of the unsorted portion to the end, comparing each element with the element at the current min index. If a smaller element is found, the min index is updated. After the inner loop finishes, we swap the element at the current position with the element at min index, placing the smallest element in its correct position. This process continues until the entire array is sorted. Finally, the function returns the sorted array. Despite its simplicity, selection sort has a time complexity of big O of n square. In all cases, because it involves nested loops to find the minimum element and perform swaps. However, its space complexity is constant time, as it sorts the array in place without needing extra memory beyond a few variables. Next, we'll discuss merge sort. But before we dive into visualizing the sorting process, it's important to understand how merging two sorted lists works to ensure that the resultant array remains sorted. Let's first look at the code for merging two sorted lists. First, we define the function merge that takes two sorted arrays, left and right, as input parameters. We then initialize a new array called result, which has a size equal to the sum of the sizes of both input arrays. Next, we create two variables, i and j, both initially set to zero. These will be used to keep track of our position in the left and right arrays, respectively. We run a while loop with the condition that i is less than the length of the left array and j is less than the length of the right array. Inside this loop, we compare the element at index i of the left array with the element at index j of the right array. If the element in the left array is less than or equal to the element in the right array, we append the element from the left array to the result array and increment i by 1. Otherwise, we append the element from the right array to the result array and increment j by 1. After the loop ends, one of the arrays will be exhausted while the other still has remaining elements. 
We then extend the result array with the remaining elements from whichever array still has elements left. Finally, we return the result array, which now contains all elements from both input arrays merged and sorted. The time complexity of the merge operation is linear because it involves a single loop that processes each element of the two input arrays exactly once. The space complexity of the merge operation is also linear because we need to allocate additional space for the result array that holds the merged elements. This extra space is proportional to the size of the input arrays, making the space complexity linear. Now, let's see this visually. Imagine we have two sorted arrays, array 1 and array 2. The algorithm will first create a new array to hold the merged result. It will then initialize two pointers, i and j, to track the current index of each respective array. As the algorithm compares the elements at these indices, it will copy the smaller element into the new array and increment the corresponding pointer by one. This process continues until one of the arrays is fully traversed. Once that happens, the algorithm will extend the new array by appending any leftover elements from the other array. This ensures that all elements are included in the final sorted array. Now let's perform merge sort. This algorithm works by recursively dividing the array into two halves until each subarray contains only one element, which represents the base case. In our visual representation, we will use a light bluish color to indicate these base case elements. If the array has an odd length, we split it such that one half has one more element than the other. Once we reach the base case with individual elements, the algorithm starts merging them back together in a bottom-up approach using the merge function we've defined earlier. This process combines the individual elements into sorted pairs, then sorted quarters, and so on, until we finally obtain a fully sorted array. The code for merge sort is straightforward. First, we define the function merge sort, which takes an unsorted array as the input parameter. The base case of the recursion is when the length of the array is less than or equal to one, meaning the array is already sorted. Next, we calculate the midpoint of the array by dividing its length by two. We then recursively apply the merge sort function to both halves of the array, storing the results in the left and right variables. Finally, we merge these sorted halves together using the merge function and return the merged array. The number of divisions of the array is proportional to the logarithm of the number of elements. During each level of division, we merge pairs of sorted arrays, which takes linear time. So, the overall time complexity will be big O of n log n. Now, the merging of arrays requires big O of n space, and the depth of recursion is log n but the dominant term is n, so the overall space complexity would be big O of n. Next is the quick sort algorithm. Before performing sorting first, we need to see how a partition algorithm works. Let's walk through the code for the partition function first, which is a key part of the quick sort algorithm. First, we define the function partition, which takes the array r, a starting index low, and an ending index high as input parameters. The pivot element is chosen as the element at the high index of the array. This pivot element can actually be selected in various ways. In this example, we picked the last element, but you could choose the first element, the middle element, or even a random element from the array. The choice of the pivot can impact the performance of the quicksort algorithm. We then initialize a variable i to low minus one, 
which will track the position where the smaller elements than the pivot will be placed. Next, a for loop runs from the low index to the high minus one index. In this loop, we compare each element in the array with the pivot. If an element is smaller than or equal to the pivot, we increment the index i and swap the element at position i with the current element at position j. This ensures that all elements smaller than or equal to the pivot are on the left side. After the loop completes, we swap the element at position i plus one with the pivot element, placing the pivot in its correct sorted position. The function then returns the index i plus one, which is the final position of the pivot element. Now let's see the visuals in action. First, we choose the pivot element, which in our case is the last element of the array. Next, we initialize two variables, j, which starts at the first element of the array, and i, which is initially set just before j. As we iterate through the array, we compare whether the element at index j is less than or equal to the pivot. If it is, we increment i by one and swap the elements at index i and index j. This process continues until j reaches the end of the array. Finally, we swap the pivot element with the element at the i plus one position, placing the pivot in its correct sorted position. This process essentially creates a partition. All elements smaller than the pivot are moved to the left of the pivot, while the larger elements are positioned on the right. The pivot now sits in its correct sorted place within the array. Note that the elements to the left and right of the pivot don't need to be in any specific order at this point. The partitioning step only ensures that all smaller elements are on the left and all larger elements are on the right, but they aren't necessarily sorted within their respective sides yet. Now let's perform quick sort using this partitioning method. First, we'll partition the array, starting with the last element as the pivot, arranging all the smaller elements to its left and the larger ones to its right. Then we recursively apply the same partitioning process to both the left and right subarrays until each subarray contains only one element, which is the base case, meaning the array is sorted. At the end of this process, we obtain a fully sorted array. Now, in the best and average cases, the depth of recursion will be proportional to the logarithm of the number of elements. This happens because the array is split roughly in half at each step. Since it takes big O of n time to partition the arrays at each level, the overall time complexity becomes big O of n log n. The space complexity depends on the depth of recursion. So in the best and average cases, it is big O of log n due to the balanced divisions of the array. However, the worst case scenario happens when the pivot selected is either the smallest or the largest element in the array. This leads to highly unbalanced splits, with one side having almost all the elements. In this example case, the array is already sorted, and the pivot is also the last element, meaning it will be the largest in every case. This results in a recursion depth of n rather than log n, as the partitioning is not balanced. As a result, the time complexity in the worst case becomes big O of n square, and the space complexity also increases to big O of n. Now the code for quicksort is pretty simple. First, we define the quicksort function, which takes the input array and two parameters, low and high, representing the starting and ending indices of the current portion of the array. The base condition for recursion is when low is less than high, meaning there is more than one element in this portion to sort. If this condition is false, the recursion stops. Inside the recursive call, we invoke the partition function, which rearranges the elements in such a way that all smaller elements are to the left of the pivot and larger ones to the right. It returns the index of the pivot, which is now in its correct position. After partitioning, we recursively apply quicksort to the subarrays on the left and right of the pivot. This is a summary of the time and space complexities for all the sorting algorithms we've discussed. In the table, the columns labeled best, average, and worst represent the time complexities for each scenario. 
The space column indicates the space complexity for the algorithms. It's important to note that the space complexity remains consistent across all algorithms in all situations, except for quicksort, which can vary depending on the situation.